this goes back to uh, a series before the monks, and um, it uh, it has a lot to do with the idea of uh, the power. The paintworks display reminds me of Claude Monet's painting, Westminster Bridge and Houses of Parliament, and I enjoy that echo. Impressionist paintings are endlessly popular and much maligned as somehow culturally obsolete. But for anyone... I, I, was, I, I, I have always been fascinated by... Well, not fascinated is probably too strong a word for it, but um, uh, the circus, um, I wouldn't be totally mad about a lot of the acts. Thank you. Um, so I want to welcome everybody here. Um, I'm so pleased that we are actually able to have some form of launch uh, for our new exhibition, small, uh, new small work, Harper's Hog and Shinners. And we're very much looking forward to your questions to uh, the artists uh, towards the end of this. My name's Jill Cousins. I'm the CEO and director of the Hunt Museum. And um, I'm very pleased to be here tonight with you all. To cope with the museum being closed, we decided to create a real virtual exhibition of the works by the three artists so that you get more of a feel of being in an exhibition. So the format for the next 45 minutes or so um, is an introduction by our curator, Naomi O'Nolan, who will take us through the virtual exhibition followed by John Logan in conversation with our three artists, uh, Charlie Harper, Gavin Hogg, and John Shinners. And then if you place your questions in the chat, I'm going to relay them to our guest stars uh, to answer. So I'm going now to hand you over to Naomi and her two very able assistants uh, to take you through uh, the exhibition, uh, Sean and Anna, who have put all the work into creating this exhibition in the first place. So Naomi, over to you. Hello everybody and you're very welcome. Um, when we were planning this exhibition last year, little did we imagine uh, we would be bringing this exhibition to you in a virtual gallery. We would have expected a huge gathering and buzz of excitement in our, in our gallery um, in the museum for tonight's opening. Um, but instead, we welcome you all to the virtual world. Uh, so many exhibitions this year have been cancelled or deferred. Uh, so we really, we're really very pleased and excited to be in a position to present this new exhibition uh, featuring the work of Charles Harper, Gavin Hogg and John Shinners in the virtual, this virtual medium. We deliberately decided not to replicate our exhibition gallery. We wanted to create a space with a virtual look and feel and in a very contemporary style. Um, we, as Jill just mentioned, we're very lucky to have two recent graduates from LSAD, Anna and Cyan, uh, working with us. So they have created the virtual gallery. Um, and what was involved in creating this gallery? We photographed the paintings, uh, created the spaces, installed the images and the text. exhibition and we will do just a short walk through the gallery. Um, so um, the first uh, thing you will see is just a short introduction to the exhibition on our first on our entrance wall. Um, there are 45 paintings uh, in total um, and each artist's work is hanging separately. Um, so we're going to start in the virtual space with John Shinner's work. And in John's semi-abstract work, uh, he revisits popular themes such as lighthouses, scarecrows and kites. He has 18 works in the exhibition. So when you're moving through, if you want to zoom into a work, um, you just, you can zoom in and there is a little panel on the, an information panel uh, that you can click on, which will give you all the information uh, 
um, the, dement the title, the dimensions, um, medium and the price. Um, and uh, with, on some of the paintings, there's also a little audio symbol. Um, and here you can uh, listen to the artist talk about, the, talk about his work. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge Alison, our wonderful Alison, who uh, created all the content for the, for the audio. Um, and if you're interested in purchasing a work, there is also uh, a, little, um, a little symbol here where you can um, contact a request um, um, uh, information on the painting and the museum will get back to you straight away. Um, as showing works um, uh, virtually is very challenging and a, different, uh, and a different experience from viewing the works in the physical space. Um, as I said, we created that audio. It, 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 it just gives a new dimension to the exhibition and it brings life to the virtual space. Um, so- um, This um, piece is, represents the little lighthouse at St. John's Point in way up in the north of the country. I, I, in terms of Sligo, um, that's just a little example of of um, of of the audio, and um, so we move along to uh, Gavin Hogg's uh, works. And um, Gavin has nine paintings in the exhibition, and he has an audio with with all of his paintings. So it's the same um, process here. You, if you want to zoom in, you can uh, just to get all the information on the on the object. And the same applies if you want to to buy a painting. And, uh, and then we will move on to Charlie Harper's. We just move around the gallery and uh, the, same, the same process. Um, and if you don't want to go around the whole gallery, you can just view the catalogue. We have um, a catalogue here and you can actually zoom in really closely to the work. Uh, to the work. Um, I don't know if we see it here. Now. Here we have it here. And you can zoom right into the work there and all the information is there um, uh, about each painting. Um, and um, as the museum is not reopening until the new year, we can arrange private viewings of the exhibition uh, by appointment. Um, and um, as I mentioned, all the works are for sale and the exhibition gallery will reopen on the 5th of January. So that is just a very brief uh, tour around the gallery and I will hand back to Jill. Thank you, uh, Naomi. Um, and uh, thank you for taking us through the uh, virtual exhibition. Um, just so everybody knows, you can find it by the website, but we'll put the link up to it uh, towards the end of uh, this um, event. Um, so now I've got the pleasure of introducing uh, John Logan and our three artists. Uh, so John Logan, uh, he's a historian, former head of the history, of de history department at the University of Limerick, former chair of the Hunt Museum Trust, an erudite writer on architecture, art and culture. Not sure that the artists uh, need an introduction, uh, but we have in conversation with John Logan tonight. Charles Harper, who studied at the National College of Art and Design, Limerick School of Art, uh, of Art and Design and the Graphics Studio in Dublin, as well as studying filmmaking in Germany. His paintings are well known for their metaphoric themes, including boats, the human form, landscape and angels, usually in a painterly expressive form. And he's represented Ireland in, at international biennales in many countries, receiving national awards for his painting, including first prize for his work commemorating the 1916 uprise, uh, rising at the Municipal Gallery of Modern Art in Dublin. More recently, he was awarded the Bull, Bull I'm going to get this wrong, Bull, Bullia Award at the RHA um, in 2008. I really loved uh, Aidan Dunn's critique in the Irish Times last year of Charles's work being done in a fairly cool analytical vein and with the underlying suggestion that there is always a tension between the individual and the collective. Our second artist is Gavin Hogg, practicing artist for nearly 30 years. He studied it also in the Limerick College of uh, School of Art and Design, has a master's degree from Birmingham. 
is exhibited widely and won numerous awards, um, the Evera Award uh, winner of 93, and achieved wide critical appreciation for his work, which is included in many public and private uh, uh, collections. He's currently working in Limerick as a full-time practicing artist. I was particularly interested to learn that uh, both um, our own collection, uh, using angel with scroll carving and that of the Limerick Museum's uh, uh, Limerick Lace Child Communion Apron, have inspired some of his past works uh, and his own works about his art, uh, which I rather liked. Its ability to take the viewer somewhere else, even if it's only for a moment, as they see something which they hadn't noticed before. And then perhaps the seeing creates a new thought or connection and the imaginative adventure begins. And uh, thirdly is John Shinners, studied drawing and fine art painting under John Donovan at the Limerick School of Art and Design, where in 2014, February, he was awarded an honorary fellowship. His work is in many public and private collections and he's received a number of awards. In 1997, he was a subject of the RTE documentary by Gavin, uh, by Gavin, by Michael Garvey, uh, Split Image, John Shinners. Mostly because I feel if I'm not working at my painting, there's something missing. Uh, I, I can't understand what that really is, but it's something from within myself. Uh, it's an instinct, I think. It's uh, it's a an approach that uh, can't be easily intellectualized or theorized about. But I do have theories, and I do have uh, uh, some understanding of uh, what my intentions are when I paint, yes, and I what effect I'd like to have on others. But ultimately you let the picture, you let the work speak. Correct. Uh, I look at the work as a, uh, a language. Yes. And uh, I'm the uh, manufacturer of the grammar of that language. I have control over it, um, which is technique, color, line, and so on. And uh, it's putting those things together and making sense out of them in a way that can be uh, understood, hopefully, by others. Well, you see all of that, I think, in uh, your boat paintings, your oarsmen. And I must say, I've been attracted to them for a long, long, long time. Um, there's a certain uh, type of uh, procedure you seem to follow. The boat cuts into the picture from below. And it's generally viewed from above, and the oars are, are spread out. Um, is the image in itself the attraction, or are you saying more than that? The image is extremely important. Uh, I, I, I've thought about it a lot, of why it happened, and why did I choose a, a boat as a metaphor. And uh, I, I traced it back to my youth uh, in Limerick, sitting on Sarsfield Bridge, looking down and seeing those uh, teams of rowers yeah. uh, rowing, coming out like a dart or a hypodermic needle from underneath the bridge. So you're that, you have this sort of long line uh, in form. And uh, I think that's where that came from. I've always had a thing about uh, uh, the water. Um, as I, I was born on an island off Ireland, that's Valencia Island. And uh, I was too young to remember that because I was a month when my parents took me uh, off the island. And I believe we were rowed back. That was before there was a bridge onto the island as there is today. Uh, so I, I spend a lot of my time when I paint imagining things. And I think that's where that came from as well, the, the boat uh, sort of metaphor. Um, it, you use uh, the idea of metaphor. If we could look at that in relation to your Native American paintings. Um, there are two wonderful uh, Native American paintings. Where we are now, um, in the show, um, 
and uh, are you political? I can't. I can't. Is that a political painting? It's called homage to Native American to the, to the Native American. Uh, I I think it was to do with the famine here in Ireland. Uh, where uh, Ireland uh, was or was being ignored when the famine was going on, and uh, the um, uh, we we had we were being uh, punished, I think, by the British. Uh, in that sense, it's political uh, by not serving food that was highly that was much available uh, in in during the famine. And the British, our leader, uh, they ran the country at the time, uh, didn't uh, serve us. I made an equation between that part of history and the uh, uh, American Indians, just the other way around, where they were the owners of America. They were the uh, indigenous people. And we came to them and invaded them, shot them, killed them, uh, and uh, near wiped them out as a people in order to make our righteousness uh, uh, over them. Uh, and maybe that prompts there, Charlie, from um, Irish history, but are you uh, prompted by contemporary American history, contemporary American politics, race, and so on? No. No, in this particular uh, set of paintings, uh, the it, it was to do with a downtrodden people, uh, as Ireland Irish people, poor Irish people, at the time uh, starved to death. These were uh, shot to death, and I felt passionate about that. In the same way as uh, the painting I had in my retrospective, Connolly being shot in the chair. Uh, so in that sense, my memory of, uh, of history, uh, uh, the little I know of history, uh, is it, it, it's my attempt to raise those issues and make it into general uh, uh, concern for people. I think it's very often uh, uh, huge events that happened the American Indian. Uh, even calling them Indians is uh, of so daft. Of course. Uh, could, I, could I try and link that then with, with John's uh, work, John's paintings? Um, they, John, you have a, it always strikes me the extent to which there's a hint at a narrative uh, in the titles of your paintings. I'm very taken by, for example, Wet Day, Roxborough Road, Bus Stop. Um, are you suggesting that something happened at the bus stop? Uh, this is John Shinner's, uh, John's work. Is John there? That's there me. Hello. John, I'm just interested in the idea of narrative. And uh, many of your wonderful work have um, a titles which suggest some sort of a story, something lurking in there. Uh, particularly, I'm just thinking of, um, Number 48, Wet Day, Roxborough Road. Uh, did you see something in Roxborough Road on a particular wet day? My word is Roxborough Road. Yes. I could, I'm living at Roxborough Road, John. Yes. I have done for a long time. So you pass that bus stop every day? More than once a day, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I, first of all, I, 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 I tend to see the world, and I have done for a long, long time, through a picture frame. I, I, I don't philosophy or, or um, try to politicize my, my images. I just observe them, keep them in, and interpret them through canvas, through uh, uh, of, of what painting, what have you, um, pastel drawings, watercolor, etc. They're just observations. And I just mix them together as if they were just to make that. All right, you you make those wonderful images for yourself, 
but do you are you interested in what uh, the viewer thinks think, you know. and what we might take out of them? Well, um, there's nothing to be taken out of John really in a way, you know. Um, they're just there. They are observations to the the woman with the with the umbrella, the black and white umbrella, and the um, as I can see at the left hand side, the the form of the of the actual bus stop. It is an actual image. I witnessed it, I saw it, you know, and I just put it down and that's the way I interpreted it. So what was the attraction there? Were you struck simply by the colours, uh, the greyness of the day, the redness of the bus stop, or were you thinking of other possibilities? No, there aren't any other possibilities, John. No, I mean, that's just the image. The, the colouring, as you say, gave me, it was I'll call it the first attraction as always. Not always the first attraction, but um, it, it's it's just a you know the shape of the umbrella. Yes. The, it, well, the you see that shape of the young woman, shape of the bus stop. It's, it's a compositional uh, balancing act, if you like. Yeah. Well, you see that uh, concern with image and balance in the lighthouse painting, uh, Saint John's Head. Um, Oh, St. John's Point yes. Lighthouse, yeah. Uh, was it the, you know, that sort of rugby jersey type uh, um, structure of the lighthouse that attracted you? Did you just want to capture the strength of that image or was there something else? Well, we, I think we all have to think about lighthouses, don't we? You know? <laughs> we have, we have. <clears throat> there are such solitary structures and they're, um, they were built, directed for our, our own safety, yes. you know, for the safety of mariners, what have you. But as I've always been um, uh, very interested in contrasts of colour, i.e. between the light and the darker shade, and the black uh, and white of St. John's Point Lighthouse gave, gave me that, um, let's say, to... Um, no, it's just a perfect balance of colour, John, and the colour that goes on in between it, the contrast between the black and the white, and uh, the, the vertical <laughs> shift. Um, it's an extraordinary shift in scale. Uh, I remember when you were doing uh, lighthouses, some of the first of your lighthouses I saw were very, very large canvases indeed. Uh, it must be very difficult to compress that intensity into such a small, small space. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, 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 I've never, I, I think, experienced difficulty with scale. You know, I mean, when you're young and you're somewhat inexperienced, <clears throat> you probably think of a, of a subject. Yes, this is what, what I'm going to paint, what I'm going to draw, but. Um, you can never really determine the exact scale as how to put it off successfully. I think that in time you learn to do that. Yeah. And uh, it, it, and you can create a, 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 con a convincing image then um, with once you have determined uh, the actual scale, the, the, the scale, you know. But one of the great things for the viewer you know, members of the public like myself, is that uh, the smallness of these works and uh, in this show generally, uh, you know, you're drawn to them. You have to look very, very, very closely. Uh, and, uh, and then you realize this is not a small painting at all. There is an intensity and immensity uh, here that's uh, quite demanding, I think, on the viewer, but certainly well worth uh, coming to grips with. Uh, Gavin, you're works here in this show are slightly bigger. Um, yes. Uh, they, they, I was immediately, when I flicked through, took my first view through the images, uh, the one that I kept going back to was My Gold. Uh, I must say it's... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I suppose um, it's the extraordinary contrast between the naturalism, the optimism of the plant and the background. 
it's, it's an extraordinary contrast. Yeah, well, the, the horizon line, that gold, uh, sorry, silver horizon line is something yeah. I've always been fascinated <laughs> by. And it's, it's, it's what I take as being a very kind of Irish horizon line, the leg gray sky with that silvery light. And then, of course, the, the, that singular plant, which is inspired actually by the, uh, a tree in the Burren. So wow. it's the idea that tenacity of the organic growth. Um, and that kind of contrast. And then there's the alchemical um, connotations or, or metaphor there were from the black, from the black soil or the shadow circle, the ellipse uh, that uh, new life grows. It comes from the Jungian idea where we keep things um, submerged in the shadow areas. But a lot of these shadow, these things that we keep repressed actually can be um, extremely useful to us. Uh, they can enrich our lives. And so there's the black circle fringed by gold, um, which is, and then there's the rain, which itself turns from gray into gold. So it's the idea of the al alchemical transformation, the base matter into something higher, into something more. So I gather from what you're saying that you're studying, reading in psychology and philosophy. Yeah, yeah, all the time. When I'm out making paintings or working in the sketchbook and sometimes making prints, then I'm reading about paintings, I'm looking at paintings. And in 2012, I did a, a certificate course in Jungian um, psychology. And then that, of course, led me into alchemy and a whole new language. I pick up on what Charlie said about the idea of language, a whole new language of metaphor and symbolism. And that's what I'm looking for all the time within the painting is to broaden my language and to see how much language I can actually acquire. And then to, to, to limit, I suppose, the conscious control as much as possible, where I can just start a painting and see where it leads. I obviously have my own biases in terms of structure, pattern, color, etc. But I'm getting to a stage where anything um, which sparks a creative idea uh, can be... Uh, considered and usually acted upon. Uh, that's very, very interesting. I think a lot of the other works uh, in this show bear that out, your works, that is. The other mm. painting that, I'm kind of, that I was drawn to is, uh, and largely I think because it brings me right back to your early grid paintings, um, the uh, pothole. Porthole. Por sorry. Sorry, porthole. No. Yes. <laughs> porthole. Yeah, porthole. <laughs> yeah, again, it's, yes, it's, um, uh, but uh, yes, the, the, the porthole. Um, again, like a play on words. The porthole actually is interesting. And um, yeah, it was the grid. And initially, this was just a straight kind of grid. And then I thought it'd be interesting to try and almost bend it or pervert it where that the circles, uh, sorry, the squares within the circle were bigger than those at the top. Um, and this is, this is actually, again, based on a long a painting, or rather it relates to a painting from a long time ago called Living Units, which again is a homage to Charlie Harper because he had a painting called Living Units back that I first saw when I was in art college in the 1980s. So his ideas of these, uh, the circle, which is young, sorry, the square, which is the Jungian symbol of the soul, here we have all these living units or souls kind of clinging together uh, against the darkness. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they, each of them admit light as such. And again, the kind of it's breaking up and they're dropping into the darkness. And I, I don't have any particular narrative for it. This is what struck me as apt at the time. And it stuck and it stayed. And then the circle, of course, and the I guess have we lost her? Um, male and female, and I, I wouldn't, I don't know, but I do know that these are all kind of parameters or imaginative resonances which the view as you look at the painting. Uh, I'm just uh, very mm -hmm. conscious that I might be hogging the show somewhat because I'm, I'm having, I'm having a whale of a time here. 
listening to you. Can you hear me? I'm just wondering if any of everybody's frozen. Our audience want to come in. Uh, are there any questions? I don't yet have any questions, so you can go on hogging. Uh, maybe. Uh... <laughs> That's not a con. That That's not. Um, all right. Can we go back then uh, to um, John? Uh, I'm not trying to kind of set you up against each other, John, Charlie, and Gavin, but in some ways, uh, I suppose I'm trying to see, is there a distinctive uh, and uh, difference, you know, acute differences between the three of you? And I say that quite deliberately because it's often suggested, particularly by people from maybe outside of Limerick, um, and we're all Limerick people now, um, they, they often, referred to as the Limerick School of Painting. Is there such a thing or is that an absurd idea? Charlie, could we start with you on that one? Is there a I, Limerick School of Painting? I think uh, there are people in Dublin and Cork and various other places who have said that. Yes. I've never thought of it, uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, that uh, I couldn't make the connection because all Limerick painters are so different from each other. So it's very hard to call, uh, call us a school. Um, uh, but I know what you're saying, and, uh, and there is a perception that there is a Limerick School of Painting, yeah. But there is one thing for me as a, as a member of the Limerick public, uh, I'd agree with you, I don't think there is a, you know, a Limerick style or a Limerick way of doing painting, but there's certainly a Limerick intensity when it comes to painting. That's one of the pleasures uh, of being in the city where there are so many professional artists. Um, do you see yourself, Gavin, as part of a, a community of artists in the city? I think he's out of sync. Is Gavin there? Well, John, I'll throw that question at you then. John, okay. do you see yourself as part of a community of artists? Not really, you know. Um, the talk about a, a Limerick School of Painting. Um, I, I don't really think that that um, ever really existed as such. Because um, uh, Jack Donovan was um, a, 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 an incredible influence on, on the students who went to the art school at the time. And it was a major emphasis on painting. You know, I mean, uh, of course, Tom Fitz was there with the sculpture, etc., and um, a, a few more like that. But um, Jack's influence uh, a lot of people. And, um, the 90s, the Limerick School became a, a huge, as you well know, a huge complex, you know, with so many uh, people there. But um, a Limerick School of Painting, I don't think so, no. I think a lot of good painters have come out of, of Limerick. It's, it's just a geographical thing. Yeah, so it's yeah. almost, are you saying it's almost coincidental then? Um, it probably is, you know. But there's, there's a good infrastructure, uh, you know, it's this, Limerick isn't a big place, yet it's had an art school for almost 200 years now, it's had a gallery for 100 it has, years. yes, exactly. At least a collection exactly. for 100 years. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, it's, it, and it's, it's probably, these factors are, are, are huge important in the development of young painters because they've got the City Gallery at their doorstep, which has a, a for its size, has got, um, has got a fine quantity of, a, of a, a fine quality of painting in, in, in its walls, what have you. What about the wider public? But, uh, and anybody who, you know, Adam, how do you feel there's a wider public out there that appreciates your work? And of course, the school is there again. All. 
Sorry, Charlie, what's the we're getting some bandwidth problems uh, slightly. Um, I do have a question, if, if I can interrupt from, from Yvonne Please Davis. Do. Um, she says, I'm sure that these three artists are aware of the reservoir of affection that they are held in by the people of Limerick. The recognition of their work is immediate. Was there ever a point when they questioned their ability to make it as an artist? Is that... Uh, about Carmen. once a week. Once a week. <laughs> Did, would you want me to answer well, that? Yeah, do, Charlie. In yes. my case, um, oh. go on ahead, John. Yeah. No, I want you Please. to answer it too, Charlie. <laughs> okay, I find, okay, I'll go first if you like. Um, when I was um. I think I, 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 I left uh, the school about when I was about 21, the art school. And I, I didn't work as a, as a tutor or a lecturer in art school. I went immediately into making a living or trying to make a living from my art without the financial backup of, 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 of employment in the art school. From time to time, over perhaps 30 or 40 years, I had to take odd casual jobs just to survive. It's only in later years that I have um, gone to, um, uh, not to worry, well, not to worry about mon money, you know. Um, so uh, I went that way. Um, what I did was, I suppose, without realizing it, I, I just dedicated myself to my work. I had no other, no other um, interest. I had no other job, um, so it was um, it wasn't the easiest of times, you know. But uh, from the twenties right up to the fifties, when I was fifty, anyway, what have you? But uh, that was just life. That's the way it was. I was up, I was down. You know, sometimes I had money, sometimes I hadn't. John, that's just the way it went. John, can I ask you, um, apart from being able to sell paintings, particularly in recent times, and I know there were must have been very, very hard times at the early part of your career. Yeah. Um, but leaving aside the art buying public, what about the general public, the people you pass in Roxborough Road? Do you, do you think they have a feeling or a sense of the artist and what the artist can do? No, no. No. <laughs> uh, the, general, the general public, I mean, I, 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 I get requests from people when I go for a pint. Uh, would you come up and paint my front door, you know? <laughs> or this type of thing. I don't mind that I... I'm used to it, you know. <clears throat> and I just tell him, sorry, I don't paint to regeneration houses. <laughs> you know. So the general public are kind of I need them a lot, you know. Charlie. Can I can I take this through with Charlie then? Charlie, I don't suppose you've been asked to paint any doors recently. Um, but what about the general public? Charlie doesn't mix same circles as I do. Yes, so yes, I say you're I, a true man of the people, and Charlie isn't. I, I, think, remember. I think every artist, at some stage or another, especially if they're a painter, <coughs> have been asked to paint someone's uh, house in indoors and outdoors. And uh, yes, I have been asked that. But that's that's right, just a little bit of humour. It's only humour, and it's uh, it's not intended as hurtful. Uh, but, but Charlie, you know, the question I want to get at is the, the business of the artist in society. I don't want to sound pompous about it, but do you think there's a, uh, you know, is appreciation of the importance of art or the possibilities of art, is that more than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago when you were starting out? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's changed uh, tenfold in terms of people appreciating uh, what artists are doing today. Um, but it's still a very small fraction of uh, society um, are 
that engrossed or involved in uh, in art, going to uh, art galleries or museums, or even asking. I th I think it's been a long time since anybody has ever asked me, or tried to in uh, engage in a conversation uh, like this, uh, a, a philosophic one uh, about why do we paint? Uh, do do we try to please people? And why are you painting all that? abstract stuff or uh, squares on your thing. Why, why not paint nice landscapes? And that sort of thing. There, is, there are huge questions and those questions are valid questions. Uh, so yes, there is a, uh, you, we could say optimistically that we're ahead of the general public, uh, but that's not good enough. We've got to be with the general public. I like the idea of museums and galleries uh, to draw people in, mostly they're free. They can uh, people can go in there. They they can get it get out of the cold, if only for that. Yes, and then get surprised by what's on the walls. I, I'd so, like to be, sorry, Charlie, for interrupting you. But I just like we lost Gavin, but I think we have him back now. Uh, have we got you there, Gavin? Because we're coming towards the end, and I want to. Are you there, Gavin? Yes. He's not here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, Gavin. That's that's really Can good. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask Gavin. We were talking here about the, uh, I suppose the the connect between the artist and the general public. Do you think uh, there is any sense of appreciation amongst the general public uh, as to the significance of artists or what artists can do? I think. Is it? Yeah, it's. I think it's complicated. I think people's attention spans are so inundated with information, and they have a tendency not to be more reactive rather than considerate of things. So I think painting a painting because they can see it, they they expect to understand it. They have this assumption that they should be able to process it because you have to process so many things. Uh, I think quite often they miss the point that it's not about processing. It's not about reaction. It's not about approval. It's about adventure and imaginative space and not knowing. Because people always seem to want to know now. I like the idea of actually not knowing. I want to be more, have more in common with that 10 year old where like, the world's an adventure. Mm. Well, so I think, yeah, it is, it's more difficult. It is, and the way you're really putting it up to us, uh, you're saying we have to keep on looking, we have to keep on asking questions. And uh, it's certainly yes. a tricky journey as you've sketched it out. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes, I think we're, we're I've got I've got one other uh, from Rosemary uh, Nuno. She's asking uh, for John, what artists actually influenced or encouraged you as a as a young painter? John Shinners. What influ uh, art? Uh, what influence artist influenced me? or encouraged you uh, as a young painter? Well, I'm influenced by myself more than anybody else. I mean, every artist has. Uh, has to uh, be their own favourite artist. You know, I mean, when we're younger, we will um, sort of uh, admire aspects of, Oops. of uh, work by other... Jack Donovan, when I first encountered him, I was only, I was only 16, and um, I, I was very strongly influenced by the man and by, and by his work at the time. But then again, I was only 16. But as Vasari said, who, who is the pupil who does not surpass his master? So um, you, you have to have friends with your painting, so to speak. Yeah. I suppose the artist will always want to stand on his own two feet or her own two feet uh, and will always want to have that sense of achievement or maturity 
Yes, yeah, yes, John. You see, I mean, it doesn't happen very often, but but, but I mean, it's quite seldom actually. If I'm in a space and I come across one of my own pictures and I stand in front of it and I put my hand on my heart and I say, I'm glad I'm a painter. I'm glad I painted that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's, it's not being immodest or anything like that. It's just being, you know, I, I get a sense of achievement that my life is worthwhile to some degree. You know, that I've, I've created something that I'm possibly proud of, if I could put it like that. You know, that I oh, take pleasure certainly. in looking in still, you know. That's certainly worth worth uh, aspiring to that. Gavin, are there any painters that you admired in your earlier days? Uh, yeah, I think Howard Hodgkins was always a winner and Francis Bacon. Right. Um, and then people like Jackson Pollock, more for the philosophy this idea of uh, bringing the artist into being full existential self-realization in the act of painting. That's always been an idea that I've always uh, aspired to and admired and enjoy. Um, to mention Jack Donovan again. And what about you, Charlie? Charlie. Okay, the, uh, initially, I'd have to say, uh, would take Jill's question or that Jill passed on, uh, was uh, what, what, why did we start doing it? I would have to say, I'll give credit to my mother. Uh, when I was a young lad, I was always drawing, scribbling, doing all sorts of things with a pencil or markers and uh, whatever, I, whatever was at hand. And she was always saying, that's very good, Charles. That's wonderful. And, and I believe that. And I'm still believing it today. I'm still uh, listening to those voices or hearing what John might say, what Gavin might say, what you yourself, John, would say. Uh, I would go out always looking for encouragement. And if I felt down, I think John would call it uh, the, the black dog. If I was feeling down, I, I would paint to cheer myself up. And I could be sure of within a few days of painting, I would be the happiest guy in the world. So painting does have a very, very good effect on me. I can't, like Gavin said, I, I can't always uh, put my finger on why, but I think it's probably the uh, echo of my mother in my head encouraging me when I, I seem to have nothing else going on in my head. So uh, encouragement is everything. Uh, after that, when we get it into adulthood and uh, we, we, we see the power behind painting about all art forms, poetry, writing, uh, there is something very, very important to society, to the society that you're part of where you can convey something of yourself and your vision to others. And uh, that's, that's really what drives me. Yeah, I think it was William Trevor once said, and here, here he was talking about writing, but he said, art starts on the kitchen table. Yes. So I think a lot of us have experienced that uh, sense of nurture, I suppose. That's yes. true. A few more two more questions and then um i think we'll uh maybe wrap up um one of them one is from sean uh, which says has COVID affected the process of your work and how important do you see exhibitions like this for the public given previous uh lockdowns maybe gavin are you with us i'm fortunate that COVID hasn't actually affected me too badly event and it's allowed me even more time these exhibitions are always important important for the artists to get the work out of the studio important for them to meet new people important for them to sell work okay uh, you know you break it break up a little bit i've got um two uh, two more well, particularly really to get bodies of work with a body of work as opposed to an individual Great. 
We've lost Gavin. Yeah, your band, your band went bad for us, uh, Gavin. Um, I've got from Devil Freeman uh, to any of the three artists. Um, what do you think of art being shared on social media? Do you think it's got a positive or negative effect, uh, impact on how people appreciate art today in contrast to the times before the internet? Uh, should we start with Charlie? I think it's very, very sad that uh, art is looked at through a second stage. You know, if someone sees art on television or a picture in a magazine, uh, it's sometimes forgotten that that's not the real thing. Um, at the same time, I think the new technologies are marvelous, are wonderful. And uh, we just haven't really fully learned how to use them, use it yet. Uh, we're making a good hand at it in this, uh, in this Zoom meeting, but um, I think that's doing good, but it's not, it's not the art. The art, you've got to go, you've got to smell it, you've got to touch it, you've got to uh, see it firsthand. Scale suffers uh, when you see things in a reproduction uh, or, or on, the, on the internet. Uh, so you have to know the totality of it by by seeing it firsthand. It's interesting. The one of the a couple of the comments actually on this have been um, whilst not present. This is from Margaret. I mean, uh, whilst not present, it's coming across as very intimate, and it really connects us uh, with the artists. Um, and I think there was another one in here. There was another one similar a similar comment. Um, there's one last one I'm going to ask, and then I think we'll. Uh, wrap up if that's okay with everybody. I think we could go on all night. It's been fantastic listening to you. Um, it says, this is from Jerry O'D. Can you ask John Shinners if he's ever managed to capture a spotted dog on canvas? Um, and if he can't, can he paint my front door? <laughs> <laughs> no, is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till I see you, Jerry O'D. I'm telling you, my boy. <laughs> um, Jill, Jill, can I say something? You may. Uh, yeah, uh, before we finish up. I, 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 uh, on behalf of, of Naomi for, for taking up, for being so welcoming of, of this exhibition and holding it under the most difficult of circumstances, and we're, we're thankful to you for that. Very good. Yeah. And, and of course, to John Logan, who's always a very, very welcome uh, opportunity to talk to him again, even though through this media, which I'm not used to at all. I don't even know on the computer. This is somebody else's, you know. Okay. While you're there, John, can you can you thank uh, Cyan and Anne, uh, Anna as well, because they've done oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> Cyan, I'm sorry, I didn't recognise you when you were down in the Hunt Museum bringing down the work. You were wearing a mask, you see. So I didn't oh, recognize you. So hello, how are you? And thank you again, both of you, very, very much. And we've got some great people who've been working behind the scenes. Uh, Kerry, who I think most of you spoke to today, who got this set up. And um, Alison, who uh, has done some Trojan work, uh, who all of you met. And uh, you'll be seeing your videos coming out um, as, it go, as it goes along. So. It really remains to me to thank all of you uh, for the time and, and the effort that you've, uh, you've put into this um, and into the uh, exhibition itself. We are open for private views um, and for uh, for, well, private views for those interested in buying. And the physical exhibition, as Naomi said, will be open on uh, January the 5th. Uh, but meanwhile, you're very um, uh, welcome to browse the, uh, the virtual exhibition. I think it's quite a nice thing to sit um, after this and we'll put, we'll put that uh, link up. So I'm going to say um, thank you to every single one of you. And uh, um, I'm going to leave you with a link to the virtual exhibition, I hope. There should be a QR code on there. I think Alison is in charge and trying to get this up. Yeah, fantastic guy. 
Um, so this is the the new small work, uh, and that if you um, click on the well, click on it. You, uh, put your phone against that uh, QR code. You can actually go directly into the virtual exhibition. Uh -huh. uh, so really, thank every one of you um, for your time and uh, for everybody being here today. Uh, oh, and I am going to say. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. That is it. Yeah. <laughs>